Good day everyone and welcome to another video. In this video, we will be discussing the derivation of the velocity profile for the fluid flowing down an inclined flat surface. This is a continuation of our equations of motion lecture, wherein we successfully derived the velocity profile for a fluid flowing inside of a pipe. To start, let's first note the differences between this flow with that of the fluid flow inside of a pipe. For fluid flow inside of the pipe, you have two boundaries wherein the no-slip boundary condition is observed, that is at the bottom and at the top boundaries of the side view of a pipe. For this example, this is a fluid flowing down an inclined flat surface. You only have one boundary, and that is the solid surface below. At the top, you don't have a boundary. We call that a free surface. So for the fluid flowing through a pipe, we expect the maximum fluid velocity to exist at the center of the pipe because you have two boundaries. However, for this instance, we are expecting the maximum fluid velocity to exist at the free surface because it's the point that is farthest away from the boundary. Okay, so that is one of the key differences for those two examples. Before we proceed, let's first acknowledge the fact that our coordinate system in this case is also tilted by the same angle in which our plane is tilted. So you notice that our x and y axis are tilted at an angle of theta. What that does is it allows our coordinate system to be in line with the movement of the fluid because the movement of the fluid from left to right is not entirely horizontal. It is at an angle of theta. If we make our x-axis at the same angle as our fluid, that makes our coordinate system in line with the movement of the fluid and thus that will simplify our solution. Okay, so let me first draw a representation of the given. As you can see here in my drawing, I simply tilted our diagram such that the fluid is now on a horizontal flow. The x-axis is now at horizontal. What that does is the pull of gravity is no longer straight downward. Instead, it is now diagonal. So what we need to do here is we need to get the y component of gravity g sub y and that's what we're going to use in the Navier-Stokes equation later. This is our velocity profile u sub x because now the fluid is flowing along the x direction. That's why our subscript is now x. And then the u sub x is a function of the position y because our vertical axis is y. Okay, this is a simpler derivation because we are now using the Cartesian coordinate system instead of the cylindrical coordinate system that we have used for the derivation of the velocity profile of the flow inside a pipe. Okay, let's begin. Let's first list our assumptions. First assumption, steady state. So that all derivatives of time will be zero. Second assumption, we are dealing with a Newtonian fluid. This allows us to maintain a constant velocity in our derivation. Next, we are assuming that the liquid is incompressible, meaning that the density is not changing. Next assumption, we have unidirectional flow. And that means that we will only have a value for u sub x. That means that we will only be considering the x component of the velocity such that the y component of the velocity and the z component are both zero. Last assumption, fully developed flow. And of course, the regime of the flow is laminar. Okay, so let's begin with the continuity equation. This is the continuity equation in rectangular coordinates. So let's see which terms will cancel. The first term is a derivative with respect to time. Automatically, that's zero because of the steady state assumption. For the second term, we have the derivative with respect to x of the density multiplied by the x component of the velocity. So we do have an x component of the velocity, so that will not be canceled. However, the last two terms will be canceled because we don't have the y and z components of velocity because of our assumption of unidirectional flow. Okay, 
So therefore, our continuity equation will simplify to density times the partial with respect to x of the x component of velocity is equal to 0. We have extracted the density out of the differential because we have assumed that density is constant. So let me first erase this and then we can proceed. Let's now have the Navier-Stokes equations in rectangular coordinates. Okay, these are our momentum equations in rectangular coordinates. Let's see which equations should we be using. So looking at the first equation, it has the x component of the velocities and our flow is towards the x-axis, meaning that the velocity of, of our fluid would definitely have an x component. So we will be needing the first equation. Looking at the second and the third equations, we don't need those because we don't have the y and z components of the velocity. Okay, but you might be asking, why are we not using the second equation even though it contains the term rho gy? And I have mentioned earlier that we need gy in our derivation. Let's go back to our illustration. If we carefully examine our illustration here, the y component of g is actually not contributing to the flow of the fluid. What's contributing is the x component of the pull of gravity. That's why we don't need the y component of gravity. We need the x component of gravity because it's the one that assists the flow of the fluid. And with that, we are only going to use the x component of the Navier-Stokes equation in Cartesian coordinate system. Let's begin simplifying this equation. The first term is 0 because of steady state. The second term is 0 because of the continuity equation. Remember, the continuity equation states that the partial derivative of the x component of velocity with respect to x is equal to 0. So this is due to the continuity equation. The third and fourth terms are both 0 because of our assumption of unidirectional flow. We don't have the y and z components of velocity. On the other side of the equation, we don't have a tau xx because our shear stress is not varying on the x direction due to our assumption of fully developed flow. We do have tau yx because our shear stress is acting on the x-axis and varying on the y axis so we retain this term while the last term our shear stress is not varying on the z direction we do have rho gx that's what we have discussed earlier however the question is do we have to retain our derivative of pressure with respect to x in our previous example for the flow of a fluid inside a pipe we retained this and we assume this to be constant because we said that this is the pressure drop of the fluid due to friction now in this example, the fluid is flowing down the incline because of the action of gravity. And the action of gravity is much more stronger than the resistive friction offered by this pressure drop. So therefore, we are assuming that the pressure drop is negligible compared to the pull of gravity. So essentially, we are saying that the pressure drop in this case is zero. And that greatly simplifies our solution. If you're confused why this term was not equated to zero during our previous example, in the flow of the fluid inside a pipe, the pipe is laying horizontally. Therefore, gravity has no influence on the flow of the fluid. That's why we retained the pressure drop as one of the influencers of the flow of the fluid. In this case, gravity is acting upon the fluid and, and is directly affecting the flow. Therefore, we can say that the pressure drop in this case is negligibly small compared to the action of gravity. And with that, we are only left with the partial derivative of tau yx with respect to y plus rho gx is equal to 0. Now, what is the x component of gravity? So if we take a look at our illustration, we say that this angle is theta. And if we take the sine of theta, we get gx over g that is opposite over hypotenuse. Therefore, gx is equal to g sine theta. We can substitute this to our simplified Navier-Stokes equation before we integrate. So let me just clear some things up and then we will proceed to the integration. Okay, this is now our simplified equation coming from the equation of motion. 
And with that, we can now directly proceed to the integration of this differential equation. So let me first transpose rho g sine theta to the other side of the equation. We have the partial derivative of tau y x with respect to y is equal to negative rho g sine theta. Integrating both sides, we now have tau y x is equal to negative rho g y sine theta theta plus c1. This is now our shear stress profile. Just as what we have done to our previous example, we need a boundary condition for us to solve for the value of c1. So let's use for our first boundary condition, the conditions at the free surface of the fluid. So why are we choosing the free surface for our first boundary condition? That's because if your fluid has a free surface, the shear stress at that point is automatically equal to zero. And that simplifies our calculations. So at the free surface, which is denoted by y is equal to L, because the thickness of your fluid layer is L, we say that the shear stress at that point is equal to zero. That is because it is a free surface. Okay? Substituting your boundary condition 1 to our shear stress profile, we now have 0 is equal to negative rho g l sine theta plus c1. Solving for c1, we have rho g l sine theta. We can now substitute c1 to our shear stress profile. We have tau y x is equal to negative rho g y sine theta plus rho g l sine theta. Simplifying, we have the shear stress profile tau y x equals rho g times l minus y sine theta. This is now our shear stress profile. This equation looks linear because the shear stress is directly proportional to the position y. Therefore, we are expecting the shear stress profile to look something like this. Wherein shear stress is zero at the free surface and it's maximum at the boundary because of the no slip boundary condition. Okay? So we need to continue our derivation for us to arrive with the velocity profile. And with that, we need Newton's law of viscosity. So for the Cartesian coordinate system, we define our Newton's law of viscosity as tau y x is equal to negative mu times derivative of velocity along the x-axis with respect to change in position y. So let's substitute. We have negative mu du x over dy is equal to rho g l minus y sine theta. Dividing both sides by negative mu, we get du x over dy is equal to negative rho g over mu. I can also factor out l to make our solution simpler. So we have negative rho g l over mu times 1 over y over l sine theta. Okay, and at this point, we can integrate again so that we can get the velocity profile. U sub x is equal to negative rho g l sine theta over mu. These are the collection of the constants times y minus y squared over 2 l. Simplifying, we have u sub x is equal to negative rho g l sine theta over mu times common denominator 2 l. This becomes 2 l y minus y squared. Further simplification leads to u sub x is equal to l will cancel. We will be left with negative rho g sine theta over 2 mu times 2ly minus y squared. 
this is now our velocity profile for a fluid flowing down an inclined plane. Okay, let's determine the expression for the maximum velocity. Again, the maximum velocity for this instance would appear at the free surface. So at the free surface, we say that y is equal to L. And at the free surface, we expect the velocity to be equal to the maximum velocity. So let's solve for that. The maximum velocity is now equal to negative rho g sine theta over 2 mu times 2 L squared minus L squared. The result would be maximum velocity is equal to negative rho g L squared sine theta over 2 mu. That means that if you know the thickness of the fluid flowing down an inclined plane, and you also know the angle of inclination theta, and you know the density and viscosity of the liquid, which are fairly easy to determine, you can solve for the maximum velocity of that fluid. For this example, there is no incentive for us determining for the average velocity of the fluid because this will not lead to the same hagen poiseuille equation that we can determine for the fluid flowing inside of the pipe. Okay, So we will no longer solve for the average velocity of the fluid. However, however, what we can do right now is we can verify the no-slip boundary condition. Remember, for the no-slip boundary condition, it states that it states that the fluid adjacent a solid boundary would be moving at the same velocity as the boundary. In this case, the bottom boundary is not moving, so the velocity is zero. Therefore, the velocity of the fluid elements at y is equal to zero should also be equal to zero. So what happens to our velocity profile if our y is zero? So if y is zero, this term cancels, this term also cancels, so the entire equation would give you ux is equal to zero. That confirms the no-slip boundary condition, and that confirms that we have derived the correct velocity profile. Okay, so that is how you utilize the continuity equation and the Navier-Stokes equation to determine the velocity profile of a fluid flowing down an inclined plane. That's the end of this example. Just keep practicing and just go through this example over and over so that you will remember how to utilize those equations to our advantage. Thank you and keep safe.